This video covers discriminant analysis and motivated analysis of variance. And um, these go by slightly different names uh, and different abbreviations. So you may see them referred to as CANDISC, LDA, uh, DISCRIM, or MANOVA. So canonical discriminant analysis, that's more of an ordination application. Linear discriminant analysis, that's for grouping. And multivariate analysis of variance for significance testing. But essentially, uh, the underlying math for all of those is exactly the same. You're just looking at different aspects of the analysis and you have slightly different questions and objectives. But they are all based on the same rotation. It's also a rotation-based technique like principal component analysis and factor analysis that we covered earlier. So the discriminant analysis group here is all based on the same rotation and we'll cover it together here in the video and the lab. So I'd like to start with our overall toolbox here to see where we are in terms of uh, objectives and techniques. So the canonical discriminant analysis sits here. Um, it can be used in exactly the same way as principal component analysis for complexity reduction. It's simply another rotation um, that you can look at of your data with a slightly different objective. Then my linear discriminant analysis that sits here. Uh, so this is about classification. We work with groups or classes, and we can make uh, predictions here. Uh, if we have an observation and we wonder to which uh, group that belongs, uh, we can classify it with this current analysis. We can also ask what differentiates uh, these classes. So if we have a number of variables, we can ask which ones are responsible for distinguishing between two or more groups. And then, um, since we're working with groups, we can also do an extension of analysis of variance. Um, so this can be used to analyze treatment effects on multiple response variables at the same time. So for example, if you have a grazing treatment and you want to know how that affects a species community with dozens of species, that would be a typical problem for multivariate analysis of variance. And so these, these are the things that we cover, and all of these are actually um, based on the same type of math. So let's start with the first one here, with the canonical discriminant analysis, because that's closest to what we already know, um, our principal component analysis. So that's a good way to think about how this may be different. Uh, so objective one, complexity reduction. Um, we rotate a coordinate system so that the variance among groups is maximized. So that is very similar to principal component analysis, if you recall. In that case, we rotated a coordinate system so that the variance among observations is maximized. So we want to stretch this data set out first in this direction as much as possible. And then once we have this one fixed for the first principal component, then we rotate around this axis um, for the second component. And once we have two of those fixed, we can still in multivariate space rotate it around a third and fourth and fifth axis. So that's a general idea behind principal component analysis. And the same idea applies to discriminant analysis, except in this case, I'm, my objective is to maximize the variance among groups. So I'm actually looking at the centroids here, at the points that I marked in black. Uh, I'm trying to maximize the variance between those. Um, so that gives me usually a better separation between groups. So here you see the red and the blue overlap. But if I look from a slightly different angle at this coordinate system, I can actually maximize the variance between groups. It's again a canonical procedure. So canonical comes from canon. So you do the same thing over and over again. Um, so once you have the first axis fixed that maximizes your variance between groups, and then you rotate around this group and see if you can, again, maximize the variance between the other groups. So the ordinations based on discriminant analysis and principal component analysis can be quite similar. Uh, they're usually not too different, although you, you always get a cleaner separation of your groups um, in discriminant analysis. So if your objective in reducing complexity is actually to show groups that you already know and demonstrate which variables distinguish between those groups, then that's the kind of rotation uh, you want to choose for the, your reduction of complexity objective. So since it's very similar, uh, I'm just going to go over uh, some of the vocabulary and points that actually apply to all uh, canonical rotation-based techniques. Um, so that's 
principal component analysis, factor analysis, and discriminant analysis. So they do have components that, that go by different names. So what you, what you put here on your x and y axis in an ordination is PC1, PC2, PC3. In case of factor analysis, you say factor 1, factor 2, factor 3. And in case of discriminant analysis, these are actually called discriminant functions. So you can call them DF1 or DF2, or sometimes they're called DISC1, DISC2, or CANDISC1 or CANDISC2. But these are conceptually, they're all the same things. So one thing that we already said, and I repeat it again, they're orthogonal. That means they're at right angles to each other. So DF1 and DF2, because I stretched it out along this way, and then I rotate around ax this axis, this always remains a right angle here, right? So that means that they're independent of each other. So they are independent dimensions in your data set uh, that you're looking at. That's true for all of these uh, uh, components here. Another way to think about what's orthog orthogonal is that your cube or hy hypercube does not get crushed or distorted. Um, so you have right angles in your original variables, and these are always maintained, so you never crush your cube or stretch it out like this, all your angles in your original coordinate system and in your rotated coordinate system, so those components here, they remain intact. So these techniques here that we'll, we'll cover later, they can actually be quite handy. For example, if you have a bunch of points that are bunched up here in the corner and you can't really distinguish very well among those, there are techniques that actually do rubber sheet transformations in multivariate space uh, that essentially stretch and twist and shear those cubes in such a way that you can visualize your point slightly better. But this is not what those classical techniques do, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. So eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so you get that wrong here, uh, let's correct this, eigenvectors, I tend to confuse this myself. Those are also the same, they apply to all those techniques. So eigenvalues divided by the number of components that you have is uh, the same as the variance explained by each of those components. And the eigenvectors are the loadings. Um, so this is just a synonym. And uh, the loadings are also referred to as standardized coefficients. And what they are is correlations of your components or discriminant functions with the original variables. And I also explained this as a projection of that multivariate hypercube onto a two-dimensional plane, right? You probably remember this. So if we take away the cube but keep those axes here, those are the vectors that are the same as loadings or eigenvectors. And then last but not least, your component scores that also applies uh, to all those techniques. They're always a linear combination of the original variables. And uh, while this is not explicit in principal component analysis, in discriminant analysis, these are actually called discriminant functions because they are linear functions. So if we go with this uh, example here, so if we now imagine we do a discriminant analysis, so we get two new axes here, uh, discriminant function one and discriminant function two, I need to know what the coordinates of each of those individual points are. So if I want to know what the coordinate of this point is here, I have to calculate this. And I can do this with my discriminant function. So those coordinates here on df1 and df2, that's calculated with the discriminant functions. And the way they look is like a simple linear regression. So you have some sort of coefficients 0.27 times the sepal width, so that's your original variable, another coefficient times your petal width, and another coefficient times your third variable. So the components in every case really are functions. In discriminant analysis, we actually call them discriminant functions. So you can simply plug in your measurements, such as sepal width, petal width, and sepal length. So you plug in the numbers, uh, and you can get your component score or discriminant function score. So one thing in which discriminant analysis is different from the other ones is that you don't retain as many dimensions in discriminant analysis as you have original variables. So both in factor analysis and PCA, 
if you have 17 variables, uh, you have 17 principal components or 17 factors. Uh, that's not true in uh, discriminant analysis. So in this case, the maximum number of discriminant functions that you can get is the number of groups minus one. And it's easy to see why that is. So let's say I only have two groups, the red group and the blue group. Regardless of how many variables uh, this is based on, I really only have one function that distinguishes between those two. And whatever I do in terms of rotation after that, the maximum variance between those two centroids is already explained. So if I have two points, I only really need a 1D line, so one discriminant function uh, that explains the maximum variance between those two. And if I have one more group, uh, let's say the green group in addition, then I really have a triangle and that fixes it. And I can perfectly express this on a two-dimensional uh, plane. So I don't need any additional factors in order to show the maximum distinction between three groups. And um, if I had four groups, you can imagine that as a pyramid here, that pyramid would be perfectly described in three dimensions and so on and so forth. So the maximum number of components is, in case of discriminant analysis, restricted by the number of groups. And that's actually a common problem. If you have uh, just two groups, uh, you can't actually do a plot like this. So the canonical discriminant analysis will simply refuse uh, to plot this. It will just put things on a line and that's it. There is no other dimension here. So that's one difference to keep in mind. So once I have my ordination, I can actually use this for different purposes. Um, the second really common application of discriminant analysis is to predict group membership. That's quite widely applied in paleontology, for example. I may have some fossils from different species, let's say Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens. Uh, maybe this is a plot of multivariate measurements on uh, some bone, like a hip bone or a cranium. Uh, so you can do all kinds of measurements, the length, the width, uh, all kinds of ratios, uh, volume. And let's say those have been previously classified and I find a new fossil, I can now use uh, my discriminant functions to actually plot out where they sit. So if I want to know this new fossil that I just found, and to which species does this belong, I just take my measurements, I plug it into that equation here that we, uh, that we had above. So in that case, that may be the length of the jaw, the volume of the cranium, and the width of the eyebrow or something like that. So once you have that ordinated, um, you can ask what species does this new fossil belong to? So you just calculate the position and you uh, measure the distance to the centroid and the shortest normalized Euclidean distance would then be the basis for your classification. So if the shortest distance is to, is to the centroid of the red group, then uh, that's going to be a homo habilis. And this normalized Euclidean distance, that's also called a Mahalanobis distance. Uh, I'm not going to explain this right now, how this exactly works, because that'll be covered in great detail in one of the subsequent lectures. But you can simply think of it as a, as a distance in multivariate space with all the axes of the original variables uh, being expressed as standard deviations from a mean of zero. So that's what that is, Mahalanobis distance. Now, if you do this kind of classification, you might wonder how good are my discriminant functions to distinguish between uh, those species. And you can see here in uh, the red case, that looks pretty good, so that group is nicely isolated. But the blue and the green group here, they overlap slightly, right? So they are not as well distinguished. So I see there's already some overlap here. So that green one is actually closer to the centroid of the blue group than uh, its own group. And the same for this one here. So that's closer here than it is to the blue group. So the expectation then is that the variables that I have are, are not really perfectly able to distinguish between those two species. And I can quantify this expected accuracy of classification in a confusion or misclassification matrix. Um, so the way this works is that I look at my observed classification. So those have been done by paleontologists and may not necessarily be just based on the observed characteristics that I have here, but maybe also uh, on a full skeleton or, or based on radioisotope dating. There may be more information that went into the original classifications. But now I have this prediction that I can make just based on some bone measurements. 
to see if I can classify an incomplete fossil where I don't have all the measurements. And that's based on the distance of my individual observations to those group means here. Um, now if I go to the red group here, um, so my observed and predicted are all the same. So what that means is all my red points here, the closest centroid is the red centroid, right? So there's no confusion with the other groups. So we get six out of six, I have 100% classification accuracy. Now with my green group, that's a little different. So I have seven observations here. Um, six are correct, one is wrong. So if I look at this graph again, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven observations, but this one is actually closer to the blue centroid, so this would be misclassified. Um, and the same is true for the uh, blue group, so there's one misclassification toward the other one. Um, so in that case, I only have an 86% or an 80% accuracy. And so that's important information. So generally, my predictive accuracies of this model is better for the red group uh, than for the blue and the green group. Uh, you might not always be correct about this classification. And last but not least, uh, you can use discriminant analysis for significance testing among groups. So this could be, for example, a grazing experiment with a control that may be some business as usual. And then I have new treatments that I want to try out, maybe with different stocking levels or different time periods where I do grazing. And I just want to see what kind of effect does this have on a on my species community. So which species benefit from different grazing treatments and which ones don't. So I have a multivariate species response, right? So it's not just one variable that I'm interested in, but uh, many at the same time. And that's a case for a multivariate analysis of variance. So I'm asking, is there a significant effect of my treatments on species composition? And I also want to quantify how the species composition is affected. So here you can clearly see that grazing treatment one favors species three and species four, so they like this kind of treatment but species one and species six benefit more from the control or grazing treatment too. Or let's say uh, if you have an experiment where control is some sort of natural state and then the blue and the green ones is some sort of management intervention where you want to have the least impact on your ecosystem, you would say, well, blue actually has quite a big impact versus the green uh, treatment here is very similar to your natural control. So maybe that would be the preferred management prescription. So MANOVA is very similar to analysis of variance. Um, so instead of one dependent variable, so you could ask, for example, how was cattle weight affected by those different grazing treatments? So the cattle that graze there and at the end of the season, you could ask, you know, under which treatment have they grown the best? So that's that would be a typical analysis of variance problem with one dependent variable. So that distinguishes multivariate analysis of variance and analysis of variance. Um, now, both of those actually can have multiple predictor variables. So the number of predictor variables does not matter. So I can have both single and multiple predictor variables for ANOVA or MANOVA. Um, so just to give an example for multiple predictor variables, I could ask, how do grazing and a fertilizer treatment affect my grassland species composition? Um, so that would be a MANOVA problem because of the species composition. Or I could ask how those two variables affect my cattle weight. That would still be an analysis of variance because I have a single response variable. So that would be a factorial design with two factors, grazing and fertilizer, but it would be an ANOVA, not a multivariate analysis of variance. And just for you to see how this conceptually would work, uh, we can go back to this graph here. So if I were to collapse all my points in from multivariate space onto that discriminant function one, you know, I, have, I would have normal distributions here around my group means on in the discriminant function one dimension. And I could ask, you know, is there a significant differences between my groups if I collapse this into a univariate problem? And so once I'm done with this, I can ask the same question for discriminant function two, and I can calculate p-values based on the hypothesis that red, and the green, and the blue distributions are actually all the same. So how likely is it that I see differences as big or bigger than uh, what I see here just by random chance? Uh, so that would be the p-value that you get out of a multivariate analysis of variance. So with that, uh, you can try all this out in lab number four.
there's a whole pile of different examples and application here uh, what you can do with good discriminant analysis and i'll post also a second video on the assumptions of the classical multivariate techniques this is less important for the factor and principal component analysis and also not that important for the canonical discriminant analysis or the classification but for the last part so when you get into p-values there it's actually to some degree advisable to think about assumptions of an inferential statistical analysis so we'll, we'll cover the assumptions in the next video